This video is going to be an overview of bacteria and then even a little mention of viruses at the end, just as kind of a survey of the great diversity which exists within this group. So if we were to ask a question about life on Earth, um, clearly, I think, you know, we think of ourselves. We think of dogs and birds and bears and lions, etc. However, if you were to just take um, this one study, it was done in uh, the eastern United States, a milliliter of uh, water just from a wetland. Um, there were 300 million bacteria in a milliliter and then uh, 4 billion viruses. And if you were to ask, well, is that unusual? The answer would be no. Even if you were to go to Antarctica, Antarctica, you know, you find water there, you can find a million living things in a space this big. If you go into the ocean water, um, uh, etc. And so there is an incredible amount of life on our planet Earth. In fact, we've been able to, to find bacteria in rocks miles underneath uh, uh, the surface. Uh, and so uh, life, you know, there's an incredible amount of life, but most of it is very, very uh, small. And when we start looking under the microscope, it becomes evident uh, that there are two types of cells on Earth. Now we'll get to viruses at the end. Viruses are not um, uh, cellular, um, um, but there are two kinds of uh, cells uh, that we find based on uh, structure. We're going to start off with bacteria, not only because they are the smallest and the simplest, as we'll see, but they also come first. All right, and so if you were to look at Earth's history, bacterial fossils are known from three and a half billion years ago, um, about a billion and a half years before the larger, more complex cells. So not only are bacteria the most common life on Earth today, they are also the first life. And we should consider them um, because even if we're not that interested in bacteria, if we're more interested in ourselves. Well, when we ask, well, what enzymes do I use in my, you know, um, uh, say small intestine to digest meat? There are enzymes called serine proteases. What enzymes do bacteria use? Serine proteases. Now, since they came first, the same would be true with aspartate proteases like Pepsin. Um, uh, the, uh, since these bacteria came first, that means that if I have these enzymes and bacteria have these enzymes, if I use globins, you know, to bind oxygen and bacteria have globins, um, if I, you know, have this way of making DNA or transcribing DNA and so do bacteria, um, that means that they invented it, all right? So that um, the early life on earth um, developed a number of uh, different uh, mechanisms uh, to obtain energy, to synthesize molecules that were passed down to the uh, descendants, not only the bacteria today, but all life on Earth. So the first life on Earth was the ancestors of all life on Earth. Another reason then to study um, these uh, prokaryotes is we learn a, a bit about ourselves and what aspects of our physiology was laid down very early. Um, as we will see, uh, we still have bacteria uh, that we drag around with us. So uh, large intestines, for example, are full of bacteria. They can be a third um, bacteria which help us digest our uh, food. Bacteria are everywhere um, uh, we look uh, from uh, the sea uh, floor, even in the harshest environments that um, uh, that we can uh, uh, find uh, today. Um, and so uh, when we consider life on Earth, uh, these bacteria are not unrelated to us, all right? So if you were to have all of the animals and then you were to have you know, yeast and plants and bacteria, it would turn out that life shares uh, common features. So we think that from the earliest life, then um, all modern life evolved through uh, descent, changing over time. Some uh, life stayed rather simple, like the, uh, the bacteria uh, today, which are prokaryotic cells, as were the first 
uh, types of life on Earth. But then some of the descendants became more complex. They became eukaryotic cells, and some of the eukaryotic cells would then um, become multicellular like ourselves. But still, there are many features which all living things um, uh, share. So uh, I've been using this uh, term uh, prokaryotic, eukaryotic. Uh, so let me just, uh, you know, then focus then on that. If you were to look under the microscope, then in general, one finds two types of cells on Earth. And cells are important because in what we call cell theory, um, the cell theory kind of concludes that all living things are made of one or more cells, that cells only come from um, and the reproducing of other uh, cells in uh, our modern world. Um, and so the cell is the unit of life. Um, so here you see, say, an animal cell, and here you see a plant cell. The animal cell and the plant cell, they differ. The plant cell has a cell wall. The animal cell will have centrioles. The plant cell lacks it, you know, et cetera. Um, but then you see this cell here. It is what's uh, a much smaller cell, which lacks the big nucleus that we see here, which lacks internal membrane-bound structures. And so these two cells, the uh, plant and animal cells, we call them eukaryotic cells. But this much smaller cell, we uh, refer to as a prokaryotic cell. Prokaryotic cells uh, are the bacteria today. So there are two types of bacteria alive today. They are both made of prokaryotic cells. All other kingdoms of uh, life, there are two kingdoms of bacteria we will see. All other kingdoms of life, the plants, the animals, the fungi, the protists, they are made of this type of cell. Um, and so uh, the, our study of bacteria uh, then begins with these uh, prokaryotic uh, cells. Now, as we study um, uh, bacteria, uh, just one of the, the things that I, I hope to do in a general sense is impress upon you just how diverse they are. We, we often fail to appreciate this. They are the oldest form of life, and thus they have had plenty of time to evolve new uh, forms, etc. So when we consider bacteria, they vary in shape. Some have a round shape. This is known as a coccus shape. So when you ever you hear something like streptococcus or staphylococcus, you can say, ah, that's a round bacteria. Um, then there are more rod-shaped bacteria. We call this a bacillus shape. And then there are others which uh, bend a bit. Uh, we call that a spiral shape, so a spirillum. Or if they bend a lot, we can call it a spirochete. So first off, bacteria have different shapes, and those are very common uh, shapes that you might uh, study. Um, there are more. So here you can see the much more bendy spirochete, um, and this is the one that causes Lyme disease, for example. But there are bacteria which are almost square in um, their shape. There are some which have more of a comma shape almost, uh, including uh, the, uh, the one which causes cholera. Uh, and so there are certainly a variety of bacterial um, shapes. There are a variety of bacterial sizes. Now, most bacteria are very small, about a micron uh, in size. And a micron, if you take a millimeter and split it into a thousand pieces, a thousandth of a millimeter, this would be 10 to the minus six meters. This is a micron. Um, most bacteria are you know, a micron, give or take. Um, but here are some which are almost, this is almost a millimeter. This is big enough to see with the naked eye. It's larger than some eukaryotic cells. This one is also almost a millimeter in length, although not quite as wide. So these are clearly exceptions. But when we talk about bacteria as being very small, just the fact of the matter is there are exceptions. There are some actually big enough to see with the naked eye and are actually larger than some um, eukaryotic cells. Uh, there are then other bacteria which are very, very uh, small, um, half or a third of the size of, say, an average 
uh, bacterium. And so uh, bacteria, they vary a lot. So once again, it, it's fine to talk about in general bacteria look like this or like that, um, but bacteria are incredibly diverse. And uh, so, you know, that should be uh, uh, stressed. Um, and so uh, here I have, uh, you know, just uh, another video uh, that kind of emphasizes uh, that point. So if we were to look at, you know, say the size of this microbe, and then this microbe, here's one which is square. Notice the little dots, how big this microbe is compared to uh, those uh, smaller ones. And then here, if we then uh, look at uh, the largest bacteria, look at the size difference between that tiny dot and this one. Um, so, you know, when we think of bacteria, we can't Think of them just with, you know, one, um, uh, one uh, uh, grouping. Uh, once again, this is just kind of a survey of uh, variations. Uh, so another variation is uh, the cell wall. Now, this is of interest, just if you're interested in bacterial variations. Also, since many antibiotics target aspects of you know, the cell wall or its synthesis, um, certainly our um, uh, some of our uh, defenses against bacteria like lysozyme and say our tears or nasal secretion uh, can uh, weaken, uh, you know, cell walls. So, you know, bacterial cell walls is also important in the prevention of disease. Um, some bacteria have thicker walls than others. So uh, gram-positive bacteria have much thicker walls, which is why they take up a purple stain in the gram stain. Um, gram-negative bacteria have uh, thinner uh, walls. Um, and then there are some which have a space uh, between the um, uh, outer membrane and then this uh, cell wall. It's made of peptidoglycan in most bacteria. Um, and the flagella, uh, which are here, uh, then contract and give them a bendy shape. This is why the Lyme bacteria uh, look uh, like uh, this. Um, but then there are some bacteria which don't have cell walls uh, at all. And so uh, things known as mycoplasma, such as um, some which can be parasites uh, in humans and other organisms, um, they uh, lack cell walls entirely. While we often say that only the eukaryotic cells have membrane-bound organelles, you know, like so inside a eukaryotic cell, you can see a mitochondria rack wrapped in a membrane. Um, nevertheless, um, some of the big bacteria, and then the blue-green algae, the cyanobacteria, they can have a cell membrane which is folded. So while they don't have membrane-bound organelles the way the eukaryotes do, um, nevertheless, uh, they certainly uh, do have uh, folds of extra membrane inside um, uh, their, um, uh, their cells. Now, one group of bacteria is interesting, known as archaea or archaebacteria. Now, just because I just talked about membranes, um, if you were to look at their membranes, they're different. And, and this is a little beyond us, I just want to point out. They're made of different types of lipids. There's a different type of bond. We could talk about an ether bond versus an ester bond. Um, they vary in how they branch. Um, as uh, we'll see, this allows them, you know, some of them to live in like boiling temperatures. Um, where uh, other ones without the branches can't, these branches stabilize it. Um, sometimes the membrane uh, lipids stick together as opposed uh, to normal cell membranes like yours and mine or most bacteria. So this archaea group, their membranes can be made with different bonds, more branches, and lipids which uh, stick together. Um, and uh, their cell walls are different instead of having peptidoglycan. They have another one, another molecule called pseudomurin. Um, and as a result, when we look at bacteria, we actually consider them uh, to include two kingdoms. So if you were to consider life on Earth, some of the, the biggest groupings of life, you know, we have genus and species, we have family, we have order, we have phylum. So we belong in the phylum chordata, the subphylum vertebrata. Um, but then above the category of phylum, there's a kingdom. So animals represent a kingdom. Plants represent a kingdom. Fungi represent a kingdom. Protists, we're not happy with how we classify protists, but we can call them a kingdom for now. Bacteria are not a kingdom. Bacteria are two kingdoms. So um, the archaea 
are a kingdom of bacteria. And then what's called the true bacteria, the U bacteria, that's a kingdom of bacteria. So there are bacteria which are very unrelated to other bacteria, so much so that we put them in different kingdoms. So animals and plants are separate kingdoms. U bacteria and archaea are considered to be different kingdoms. Many archaea live in extreme environments, things that you think would be too harsh for life, you know, very, you know, high temperatures, very deep um, uh, pressures, uh, et cetera. Um, uh, but uh, uh, once again, some of those cell uh, membrane modifications allow them, you know, to be in extreme uh, conditions uh, without harm. Now, it was once thought that these archaea are pretty much only in uh, these extreme environments, um, but actually they live in intestines, including ours. Um, and so the only bacteria which produce methane as uh, a waste, they're called methanogens, um, they uh, are archaea. And when you think of animal intestines, whether this be ruminants or ourselves, um, uh, uh, methane can certainly be produced. So we have methane, uh, I'm sorry, we have methanogens, which are a group of archaea living inside us. So these bacteria are not just found in extreme environments. Now, very often, if you're going to identify these, you know, it's using, you know, DNA fingerprinting uh, just because, um, you know, it's hard to sample these, you know, if they're not as common to find out exactly where uh, they are. And so, uh, once again, looking at the kingdoms of life, eukaryotes have uh, the plants, animals, fungi, and protists. But then the prokaryotes, they have two kingdoms of uh, their own, the eubacteria and the archaea. Another thing is they differ in their flagella. So some eubacteria have flagella. Some archaea have flagella, um, but they're different. They are not at all related. And so these are separate uh, groups uh, uh, which, um, you know, have adapted uh, uh, to life's challenges separately. And we think that archaea then go back, you know, about as old as the, the eubacteria uh, are. We think they go back uh, to essentially uh, the beginning um, because of some of the chemical uh, traces uh, uh, that can be found in fossil rocks, uh, which uh, are typical of archaea. So just if this is the uh, geologic history of our planet, just a quick review. Uh, our planet, you know, forms about four and a half billion years ago. Um, all of the animals are pretty much confined to this purple region. A couple, you know, in here, the simplest animals here. But if you ask, when are animals known? Only from here. When are plants known? Only from here. So, um, you know, when we think of dinosaurs, you know, they're in there uh, and this part only. So this purple part is the part of the fossil record that we're more familiar with. Um, but life goes all the way back down um, uh, to uh, the Archaean about three and a half uh, billion uh, years ago, uh, maybe even a little bit uh, earlier. And so um, life starts here but animals don't start till here. So that means that for most of life's history, life was microscopic. Our planet had life, all right, for you know a couple billion years without animals, all right? It was just very, very simple life. And one and a half billion years were just prokaryotic bacteria. So once again, bacteria are old, and these archaea, at least from the um, uh, ratios of the, uh, uh, of carbon and some of the uh, other chemicals uh, found in, um, uh, in fossil sediments suggest that in addition to the U bacteria, which we can recognize in fossils, that actually um, uh, that archaea were there as well. Now that methane, just you know, very quickly, um, we can we worry about methane for a lot of reasons. And so some biologists, you know, they study the amount of methane, say, produced by the world's cows, um, because methane has a greater ability to contribute to global warming uh, than carbon dioxide does. So that one kilogram of methane uh, has as much warming potential as 34 kilograms of carbon dioxide. So 
there's a lot of good reasons to study bacteria. There's obvious reasons, but then a lot of, you know, perhaps less obvious reasons. You know, some uh, of those who are studying um, uh, a bacteria are actually interested in the methanogens, which are archaea. And one of the reasons that one might be interested in these uh, methanogens uh, is, you know, uh, for contributions to uh, global uh, warming. Okay. Um, but once again, this was just meant to kind of give the diversity of, uh, of bacteria. Um, so there's this whole other kingdom. So there, you know, bacteria, these prokaryotic cells, actually represent two distinct um, uh, kingdoms, uh, archaea and the eubacteria. Um, the eubacteria, that'll be the primary focus from this point uh, on, um, just more variations. Some have flagella, uh, some uh, don't. Um, uh, now, of the uh, flagella, uh, there can be uh, bacteria with two uh, flagella uh, on either pole of the cell, multiple uh, uh, flagella. Some, in addition to um, uh, uh, flagella, uh, have these other extensions known as pili. Um, some spirochetes, like the one that causes Lyme, as I had mentioned, the flagellum help give rise to its um, it's specialized a shape. So bacteria can vary in, uh, in their flagella and thus their locomotion. Two very important aspects that we need to consider about bacteria is one, where do you get your energy? And two, where do you get your carbon? Living things are carbon-based things. When you look at this stuff, it is carbohydrate, which is carbon-based. It is protein, which is carbon-based. It is lipid, which is carbon-based. It is DNA and RNA and nucleic acids, which is carbon-based. So I am carbon-based. So then obviously for me, where did I get that carbon? That's an important question. But for the bacteria, where do you get your energy and where do you get your, um, uh, your carbon? Um, so we come up with different names. Uh, so something that uses light for its energy is what we call a phototroph. Okay, phototrophs are using um, sunlight uh, to get uh, energy. Um, some uh, bacteria are capable of oxidizing minerals and getting energy that way. So for example, when iron rusts, it's oxidizing. So there are certain chemical reactions that kind of want to happen. So um, uh, iron wants to rust. It's more stable in the rusted form than in the elemental form. Uh, and uh, a little bit of energy is released in the process. Um, well, some bacteria, especially say those living deep in the ocean near say a, a vent where uh, uh, the, uh, um, there's a volcanic activity, um, there are minerals which can be oxidized and in helping you know, oxidize these minerals, one can obtain energy. And so some bacteria live that way. And then, so then other organisms eat the bacteria. So they're whole ecosystems, which don't depend on sunlight. You know, the main energy source is the oxidation of these minerals. These are called lithotrophs. So phototrophs are getting their energy from light. Lithotrophs are getting their energy from um, uh, oxidizing uh, minerals. Neither of these then depend on other organisms. Um, many bacteria, and this is the lifestyle that we are most familiar with, um, need to get energy from others, and they're called heterotrophs. So a bacteria, and I'll get into this again in a second, um, bacteria which are, say, decomposing dead material, they're getting their energy from the, you know, the sugars, et cetera, of, say, rotting leaves or rotting wood. Um, a parasitic bacteria is getting its uh, energy from the molecules of its host. Some bacteria are actually predators that they can kill other cells. So heterotrophs get their energy from the organic molecules of others. Just like I get my energy today from, say, the, the sugars and the proteins I eat for lunch, some bacteria then get their energy from the sugars and proteins of other organisms, whether they be decomposing dead stuff, whether they be parasites, whether they actually be hunting uh, single cells. So bacteria vary in how they get their energy. There are phototrophs, uh, lithotrophs, and heterotrophs. Question then, where do you get your um, uh, carbon? 
Um, well, autotrophs have a neat uh, trick. Uh, uh, autotrophs then can take uh, carbon dioxide from the air um, and turn it into uh, glucose. So when we think of photosynthesis, photosynthesis starts off uh, like these uh, cyanobacteria, this, uh, these blue-green algae. Um, they take uh, carbon dioxide uh, from the air and they convert it into uh, glucose. Um, and so they are autotrophs and we could even put that together. We could call them photo autotrophs. So they get their energy from the sun and now they are getting their carbon um, by taking uh, inorganic carbon, carbon that doesn't belong to a living thing, like carbon dioxide, and um, uh, and uh, converting it into sugar. Um, and so uh, here are two uh, photosynthetic uh, bacteria. Now they're they're purple as opposed to the green ones, um, but they will differ in where their carbon uh, comes from. Um, so this one needs to get its carbon from, say, sugar from another living thing, whereas this one can get its carbon from carbon dioxide. So this one can take carbon dioxide from the air uh, and convert it into sugar. Now, not all photosynthetic uh, organisms can, so this one can. So that one was a photoautotroph. The most significant photoautotrophs in uh, bacteria are what we call the blue-green algae, which aren't really true algae at all. They are uh, bacteria. So the proper name for them is cyanobacteria. Um, and so uh, they are so diverse that we recognize um, them as a phylum. All right, so when you think of the arthropods as being a phylum, which is different from the mollusks, which is different from the chordates and vertebrates, um, the blue-green algae are a phylum, a really big distinct group from other eubacteria. Um, so these are bacteria which perform photosynthesis. They're really significant cells, so they can exist in... Um, and they can exist in colonies, in chains. So that's something that most bacteria don't do. Most bacteria are single. Here they um, exist uh, as a colony. That's uh, significant. Um, now there are other uh, bacteria which can do uh, photosynthesis. There are purple photosynthetic uh, bacteria, for example. Um, but these use chlorophyll the same as um, plants do, we'll get to why that is, and then they uh, can uh, release oxygen as a waste, same as plants. Now, this is fascinating, but it was also really important for the history of life on Earth. So if you say, look at rocks, all right, for half of Earth's history, iron really didn't rust, minerals really didn't oxidize, and apparently there wasn't much oxygen in the atmosphere. But that changed right about here, and then in the second half of Earth's history, then there was appreciable oxygen in the air. And then all of a sudden we do find uh, uh, things uh, rusting. We do find you know, these big fossil red beds where we have all of this red iron in um, uh, the minerals which are deposited. So something happens. So half of Earth's history doesn't really have uh, much uh, oxygen uh, in the atmosphere, and the second half of Earth's history does. So what happens here, and the interesting thing in the fossil record is, that's when the cyanobacteria appear. So cyanobacteria didn't always exist, all right? So um, uh, there was a, you know, uh, almost perhaps a billion years uh, of bacteria without uh, the cyanobacteria, they came later. Um, but they were then significant because they could take carbon dioxide, use sunlight, and then rearrange these atoms to produce uh, carbon molecules like uh, glucose, here's a uh, sugar. So they are called photoautotrophs. Um, they're using sunlight for energy. And see where they're getting their carbon? They're getting it from the air. Most things which are called the chemoheterotrophs. And I, for, I apologize, I misspoke earlier. Chemoheterotroph goes together. Um, 
uh, the chemotrophs are the ones that get their energy from chemicals. Heterotrophs are ones which get their carbon um, from other living things. I'll get back to that. And forgive me, I misspoke a second ago. I should have used the word chemotroph rather than heterotroph. They usually just go together, chemo heterotroph. My fault. I'll get back to that. Um, and so uh, because they take carbon from the air and turn it into biological carbon, sugars, proteins, et cetera, they are called autotrophs. So thus they're really important. They're turning sunlight into biomolecules that then other things can depend on. All right, so other things can now eat the blue-green algae, the cyanobacteria, and get their sugars, their proteins, et cetera, uh, from uh, there. So this then becomes very important for life on Earth. Now, not only are they adding oxygen to the atmosphere uh, today, um, but they uh, were then the first to do that. And so they changed the planet. Our planet has oxygen in its atmosphere because of the photosynthesis that they started, all right? Um, uh, and so uh, cyanobacteria are certainly significant. Uh, now, they are capable of living inside other organisms. So there can be cyanobacteria in sponges doing photosynthesis photosynthesis. Sponges are animals, but nevertheless, they can do photosynthesis, um, or to, to a little degree. Um, more importantly, um, cyanobacteria um, can live inside plant cells. So when we think of plants, we think of them as being green, doing photosynthesis, um, releasing oxygen as a uh, waste. Um, and the reality is that the reason they can do that is because inside plant cells are actually cyanobacteria. So there can be cells living inside other cells. I'll get back uh, to that in the next topic of protists. And so it's actually the cyanobacteria living inside um, bigger cells, uh, the plant cells, um, which uh, allow them to do photosynthesis. Cyanobacteria can fix nitrogen uh, as we'll see, get it into a usable form. Uh, and so when we look at cyanobacteria, you can actually see that some of the cells are specialized for this fixing of nitrogen. That's also something that bacteria typically don't do. They don't typically live in groups where one cell's a little bit different from the others. Your cells do. I mean, some of your cells are nerve cells, some are brain cells, I, I, some are muscle cells, some are liver cells. But here we have some cells which are fixing um, and nitrogen, uh, uh, which is not only important for life on Earth, but interesting that, back, uh, that these bacteria are a bit more complex in having um, some uh, specializations there. So, big picture, bacteria differ in their lifestyles. Once again, some can then um, use sunlight for energy. They are phototrophs. And most of these then use that energy to generate useful forms of carbon, put carbon into uh, things like uh, sugars uh, and proteins and uh, the like. Uh, those are called autotrophs. So for example, cyanobacteria, they then would be uh, photoautotrophs, getting their energy from um, uh, sunlight and getting their carbon from carbon dioxide. Um, many other bacteria are what are called chemoheterotrophs, like this one. So this bacteria is going to kill all of its neighbors. It's going to secrete enzymes that kill all of these cells. They die, they burst, and then this cell then absorbs all their stuff. So where does this cell get its energy? Well, from breaking down the energy of the carbon molecules of these cells. Where does this cell get its carbon? for its glucose, its protein, et cetera, from these cells. So this cell is what's called a chemoheterotroph. Chemoheterotrophs are getting their energy from the chemicals of living things, the sugars, the biomolecules, but they're also getting their carbon from the uh, living uh, things around them. So I am a chemoheterotroph, right? I get my energy from what I eat. I get my carbon from what I eat. And these bacteria are also chemoheterotrophs. So some uh, chemoheterotrophs uh, are actually predators. So these are bacteria that hunt other cells, 
all right? So um, they hunt other cells, they kill other cells, and as a result, they get their energy and their, um, and their carbon molecules from other uh, cells. And there's a number of bacteria that we know uh, that do this. So a number of bacteria are what we call um, chemoheterotrophs because uh, they uh, can hunt uh, other uh, living uh, things. So here's a cell that you know has invaded another. It uses that host cell for its uh, carbon and energy. Here's another bacterial predator. Um, some of them have uh, neat names uh, uh, that uh, use the word vampire, like vampirococcus, um, uh, uh, because uh, they'll kind of latch onto uh, another uh, cell and then uh, just kind of you know make a hole in it and absorb uh, the stuff almost as if they were you know sucking out you know the uh, biomolecule. So here, here's Vampirococcus. So here's a bacteria um, uh, which is a predator hunting this other one. So it's getting its energy and biomolecules uh, from this uh, larger uh, uh, cell. Um, so that's one way of being, uh, so uh, the bacteria that it's hunting on is a photosynthetic bacteria. But that's one way of being a chemoheterotroph to eat other living you know, things. Um, some chemoheterotrophs are more parasites. So for example, if I have a bacterial infection like a strep throat, uh, streptococcus is getting its energy from me and my cells. It's getting its carbon from me and my cells, but it's not killing me, I hope. So instead of being a bacterial predator, it's a parasite. So a parasite like streptococcus is a chemoheterotroph or extracting nutrients uh, from outside uh, sources and also getting its energy from there. And then anything that's a decomposing, um, uh, say dead material, like dead leaves, dead animals, decomposers are also chemoheterotrophs. So a lot of bacteria are chemoheterotrophs. They get their energy from the molecules of other living things, um, whether these be their prey, whether it be a host that they're parasitizing or whether it be dead stuff that they're uh, decomposing, and then they also then get their biomolecules, their sugars, their amino acids from other living things. So there are different ways of being a chemo uh, heterotroph. Um, now, uh, a couple of other uh, th uh, things about uh, bacteria. Um, certain uh, ones are uh, referred to as extremophiles. Um, certain uh, bacteria are extremophiles, meaning that um, that they need an extreme environment. So baro refers to pressure, like a barometer is measuring uh, uh, pressure. Thermo refers to uh, temperature. So a barophile um, loves high pressures. So it not just tolerates high pressures. There are some bacteria which can live in normal environments but can tolerate pressures. They would be barotolerant. This is a barophile. It needs high uh, temperatures. Um, so it may require a thousand atmospheres uh, of pressure. All right, so that's an incredible you know, requirement. So some bacteria need to live in an extreme uh, environment. Um, then some, are uh, thermophiles, where they like uh, high temperatures. Some are hyperthermophiles, where they like very high uh, temperatures. So you're likely to, to find uh, them near areas of volcanic activity, uh, for uh, example. Um, many um, bacteria uh, can live in hypersaline environments. So while high salt uh, con uh, concentrations kill uh, most life, some extremophiles like uh, very uh, salty uh, uh, temperatures. Um, when we think of oxygen, uh, while we certainly require oxygen, um, some bacteria can tolerate not having oxygen, but then some are what we call anaerobes, um, like many of the bacteria which live in our intestines or in you know, the mud of a swamp, for example. Um, they require the absence of uh, of oxygen. And so when we look at uh, lifestyles of 
uh, bacteria. Uh, very often we use uh, the terms like thermophile, barophile, um, and we, we find that many uh, bacteria uh, then require conditions which would be toxic for us. You know, very high temperatures, very high uh, pressures. Uh, there are bacteria uh, which uh, live uh, in ice. There are uh, bacteria which live in very salty environments as well, bacteria that live without oxygen. So bacteria are capable of living um, in many uh, extreme uh, environments. Um, bacteria are very important in environments in uh, general because they help to cycle nutrients. So when materials die, as I mentioned, some chemoheterotrophs then are decomposers, which are very important. That means all that stuff in the dead leaves, for example, that it's not buried and lost forever, but it's uh, recycled. Uh, so a lot of you know, nutrient cycles depend on bacteria to recycle you know, organic material which has died. Um, but then there's another role that bacteria can play. Um, so for example, with nitrogen. Nitrogen gas has a triple covalent bond. So these bonds are just too tough for normal individuals to make. I need nitrogen for my DNA and protein, but I can't use the nitrogen in the air. The bonds between nitrogen atoms are just too tough. But bacteria then um, can perform what's called nitrogen fixation. Only prokaryotes can do this. They can take nitrogen gas from the air and then convert this into uh, ammonia, nitrites, and nitrates that other animals can use or other organisms can use. So if it weren't for prokaryotes making useful forms of nitrogen, there wouldn't be nitrogen for my DNA or for my protein. So um, we rely on the uh, bacteria which perform uh, nitrogen uh, fixation. Uh, and so there's a whole nutrient cycle where nitrogen can be taken out of the air, it can be returned back into the air. And um, like I said, prokaryotes are the only organisms which can do that first step. So they are certainly uh, crucial. Um, if you ask why can certain plants grow in nitrogen poor soils? Well, very often um, you can find that in their roots, they have nodules. And inside these nodules, they have bacteria, all right? So if we look inside a root nodule, here are cells, and you say, oh, these are plant cells. Plant cells uh, that can grow in a uh, nitrogen uh, poor soil. But if you look inside the plant cells, there are bacteria that aren't parasites, and the plant cell isn't eating them. They are a team. They are symbionts of cells living inside other cells. And these symbiotic cells are then fixing nitrogen. The reason that this plant can grow in a nitrogen poor soil is because inside its roots, it has the symbiotic bacteria fixing nitrogen. So bacteria serve many vital roles for living things. In a couple of the videos in this playlist, I try to simulate if um, you went out looking for uh, bacteria, what you might find in natural environments. And so uh, this is obviously a simulation, um, but it tries to represent the idea that, uh, so for example, if you're looking for methanogens, uh, or the archaea which are producing uh, methane, um, you wouldn't find them in aerobic environments, like in the soil or on the surfaces of plant leaves. You would find them, say, in the swamp mud, and there would be some that you would find there. Um, if you looked uh, on the surface of the ocean, you would find none, but if you looked in the ocean mud, you would find uh, some. And then if you were going uh, very deep in the ocean, you would find others, like at hydrothermal vents. Some of these would only be found in the very extreme environments. And so as you compare the ones that you see, some of them uh, you'll find uh, in the mud of a swamp, uh, uh, the ocean floor, and in this you know, uh, very hot hydrothermal vent. But some you would only find in the hydrothermal uh, vent. And so some bacteria are more generalist, uh, being adaptable to different environments. Some are specialists, which only occur in uh, others. Uh, as we'll see in uh, a second, um, some can actually be found inside uh, the human body, like in our uh, large uh, intestines. Now, that was an example with um, 
uh, methanogens, um, but then you could do the same with different groups of bacteria like blue-green algae, pretend you're going on a field trip. And then once again, you would see that there might be some generalists which you can find lots of, uh, uh, of places, um, uh, but then others would be more specialists. So some would be only in fresh water, some only in uh, ocean uh, water, um, uh, uh, et cetera. Okay. Um, now, uh, the uh, ba uh, bacteria associated with the human body, they are becoming more and more interesting to study. We have a better appreciation of what we call our microbiome of the bacteria, which we normally associate with, you know, uh, the large intestine is where we find most of them, but they're in our mouth, in our nose, on our skin. Uh, there are lots of places, and we're beginning to appreciate that they actually affect human health and that we interact with them. They digest some of our uh, food, uh, et cetera. And so which bacteria uh, are associated with our bodies and what they do is becoming more of an interesting uh, study. And actually, just to be perfectly honest, when we look in the mirror, certainly we see, you know, human cells looking back at us. Um, but the reality is there are actually more bacterial cells because they're smaller associated with the human body than there are human cells. So you have more bacterial cells that you carry around with you, uh, uh, you know, throughout the day than you have uh, human cells. So this microbiome uh, is uh, certainly of, uh, of interest to us.